Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. Gibbons PC, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, moving the region through air, land, rail, and sea. The Northward Center, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, Fedway Associates, Inc., and by Wells Fargo. Promotional support provided by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ, part of the USA Today Network. And by ROINJ, informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. Welcome to Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. I'm joined, as you can see uh, on camera, my colleague, by my colleague and the uh, senior producer of Think Tank, Nicole Swinerton. Nicole, how are we doing? We're doing great. How about you? Doing great. Let's plug this uh, initial show. Let's introduce it. We've got United States Senator Bob Menendez, Bob Garrett, who is the CEO of Hackensack Meridian Health, and also Tammy Murphy, not just the first lady of the great state of New Jersey, but also the uh, founder of the New Jersey Pandemic Relief Fund, What's the biggest takeaway for you that people should be looking for in this program? This is a, a jam-packed program. We had a lot of great guests on this program. I think that um, viewers, viewers will take a lot away from this. I would say um, hearing from a United States Senator about the real role of the federal government in helping out New Jersey and other states that are so have been hit so hard by this crisis, sure. it, it, it gives you a little bit of inspiration for sure. I would also say, you know, hearing about the world of healthcare from Bob Garrett, um, that definitely, it really makes you realize how affected that industry is going to be for so long. And then of course, hearing from Tammy Murphy um, about the awesome work that Pandemic Relief Fund is doing, um, again, gives us hope for the future. Yeah, by the way, I just wanna remind everyone, our, our funders are the Russell Berry Foundation, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, Northward Center, also a range of other folks, Gibbons, Port Authority, the Economic Development Authority, New Jersey, Fedway, Wells Fargo, so many folks who help make us, uh, make it possible for us to do what we do. This is Think Tank. Nicole and I will be introducing all of these programs, setting them up and reminding you, particularly when it comes to the Pan Tammy Murphy segment, there's an opportunity to contribute to make a difference in the Pandemic Relief Fund. The website will be up there as well as Nicole said, United States Senator Bob Menendez giving us a sense from Washington about what's going on there and how they're handling things. And also Bob Garrett from the front lines at Hackensack Meridian Health. This is Think Tank. Check it out. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. You can tell we're like everyone else in the broadcasting industry. We're taping, producing remotely, and we are honored to be joined by the senior senator, United States Senator of the great state of New Jersey, Robert Menendez. Senator, how you doing? Good to be with you. Senator, as we tape this program on May 13th, so many things, moving targets. You, every day there's a new piece of legislation you're involved in with someone else on the other side of the aisle, your colleagues as well. What is the number one issue you see facing our state and nation today? Well, Steve, the only way that we will get to somewhat of what I would call a new normal is by near, near universal testing and community contact tracing. And why do I say that? Uh, in an economy that is controlled by largely consumer spending, you need consumer confidence. And unless we can tell New Jerseyans that their visit to the mall, to the restaurant, to the hairdresser, to the public square uh, has been dramatically mitigated in terms of the risk that they will contract uh, the virus, we're just never gonna get there. And so this is why I pushed real hard in the last uh, COVID bill that passed into law, 25 billion uh, for uh, testing. 
but there's more to be done in that regard to get to where we need to be. Uh, there's a lot of other things. Obviously, you said the number one thing for me. That's the number one thing because the nation's wealth and the state's wealth will only do better with the health of our people. And I think if we get that going, we get a lot of other things going. We still have to help our small businesses. We have to help the state and municipalities. They're just facing a, a, a shortfall. It has nothing to do with their making. Well, Senator, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, last time you were in the studio with us, we happened to be taping it with our partners at NJTV in Newark. Um, and we, we, we will be back there again, I promise everyone, when it's safe and it's right. But I remember you and I were talking about the partisan rancor, the, um, the polarization. And, and I wanna, am I naive to want to believe that that partisanship, that polarization, that geographical, hey, blue state, red state, you're not us, you have the problem, it's not us. Is, do you sense that your Republican colleagues from other states, more rural states, are sensitive to the plight of a New York and New Jersey and the horrific conditions we're facing in the age of COVID-19? Well, uh, it, it's not as widespread as I would hope that their views would be, that they would understand. As I've said to my colleagues since we've been back to Washington, what's happened to us is coming your way, unfortunately. Hopefully it won't be as harsh, and hopefully you've had the time to learn from states like New Jersey and New York what's coming and be better prepared uh, as a result of the advance warning, but it's coming to some degree. Uh, and I remind them that you know when I voted for you know, uh, funding for flooding in the Mississippi, wildfires in the West, Hurricane Katrina and on and on, I've never asked whether it's a blue or red state. It's, it's why we call this country the United States of America. And so it's disappointing to hear Senator McConnell, the Republican leader of the Senate, talk about bankruptcy. Uh, you know, his state receives $37 billion more every year than uh, it sends to the federal treasury. So uh, I, I don't begrudge them that money, but at the end of the day, you can't be talking about us in a way when that's the reality of what you've been achieving. So I'll, th I, I've been saying uh, we need everybody together, and I'm, and I'm thrilled that I have a Republican colleague, uh, Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, join with me on this $500 billion assistance to state and municipalities. I think we're going to be announcing shortly a couple other Republicans who are going to join us in the effort. That's a good bipartisan effort. Hopefully it sends a message that this is about all of us, not just some of us. Well, as we listen to Senator Menendez, uh, by the way, we're producing remotely, and this program is being recorded on the 13th of May. It'll be seen after that. We're, uh, check out our colleagues at NJTV News and Metro Focus for a daily report on what's happening in our region. But longer term, I, I don't want to go backwards, Senator, but I do want to get your assessment. And I know it's tough talking about President Trump because there's so much needed by a state like New Jersey from the White House, from the federal government. But how would you characterize President Trump's leadership here, A and B, I just want to also get a response to the fact that he said he's in no way responsible for this. He did not cause this, but is he responsible for the conditions we face today and moving forward in any way? Well, Steve, he didn't cause it, obviously. Clearly. Uh, this is a virus that uh, began in China, although I think it was largely transmitted from all the evidence we're seeing now in the United States, largely by European visitors who contracted it from someone uh, or persons who came from China. Uh, the, so he didn't cause it, but the response- No, cause this condition we're in right now because of the initial response. I should have framed it that yeah, way. Yeah, I apologize, okay. Senator. Yeah, yeah, okay. The, the, listen, uh, we have lacked leadership, both at home and abroad in this regard. Uh, States should have never had to compete with each other in the marketplace to get personal protective equipment to get ventilators. Um, there is a reason that there a federal government exists. It's in moments like this of a pandemic that you need a federal response. And I think that the president uh, has wanted to sort of like say, that's not my problem. It's not, it's for the states to resolve. It's for the governors to resolve. Uh, we, we can't do that because we have a national problem here. So I regret that he has not taken the, the bull by the horn, so to speak. I regret that he's not listening to his health professionals who in fact uh, do, I think, tremendous work like Dr. Fauci. Uh, but 
you know, it is what it is. Uh, and we continue to work to try to overcome whatever shortfalls uh, the executive branch has had uh, and try to get legislative support for the initiatives that will put us back on the road to recovery and uh, get our people healthy again. Steve Adubato here, Senator Robert Menendez, the senior senator in the uh, state of New Jersey and the United States Senate. Let me ask you this moving forward. If, in fact, and this program will be seen later, as I said, this, this fall issue, fall 2020, if, in fact, um, COVID-19 returns in any form, to what degree do you believe that the federal government is prepared in a way that they were not the first time around? Well, <clears throat> that's a great question, as you always ask great questions. And here's I don't have the answers. I just have the uh, yeah, no. Well, here's here's my view of it of that of that question uh, in terms of answering it, and that is. I still don't think we are as prepared as we should be, even though we are forcing the issue. It's tough to have oversight virtually. Uh, it's different when I can get witnesses in front of me uh, and press them about, do we have a national stockpile ready to go for a, a potential second wave of personally protective equipment, of ventilators, uh, of whatever antivirals we may have developed? Why aren't we at the table with Europe uh, on what is a multinational effort to create a vaccine. That vaccine might be created in the United States. It might be created abroad, but either way, we want to get access to it no matter where it's created, when it's created. Uh, these are the things that I'd like to see happen. I'd like not the states to, I don't want New Jersey to compete against New York for ventilators or personal protective equipment. I don't want to have to hustle across the globe to get stuff. Uh, and I'm not yet at the point that I'm ready to tell you that we are as prepared as we should be. We are pushing uh, to make sure that we are, but obviously a legislative branch can only do so much to exert pressure on the executive branch to make the executive branch do what we would like uh, collectively to see happen. And so we continue to do that. 30 seconds on this. Um, I know we're dating ourselves uh, in the middle of May, but I just, the, the Senate hearing that just took place remotely with uh, senators in a room, in a Senate room, but folks who are testifying remotely, are you okay with that, or is that just the way it has to be? Listen, it's the way it's it's the way it's going to have to be for a while because you know if you put uh, normally in the process of a regular Senate hearing, you put all the committee members, you put their staffs in, you put the committee staff in, in addition to regular staff, you put the people who operate the whole process. You're talking about 45, 50 people in a room that certainly there isn't social distancing unless you do these huge conference rooms. So the reality is, uh, and, and you have uh, elements of the population here that are in the risk category. So, you know, we're going to have to do the virtual hearings as much as possible. But I think what we should be doing is hearings and focusing on all of our committees on COVID-19, not in, in pursuing judges that the ABA considers unqualified. Senator Robert Menendez, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time your busy schedule joining us. We wish you and your family all the best and, and continued success working on behalf of all the people, not just of New Jersey, but of the nation. It's never been more important than now. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Steve. Never mattered more. Good luck, good health to you and your family and to all your viewers. Thank you. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. When I started working with children with autism over 25 years ago, my mission began. Autism is a multifaceted spectrum condition, which challenges our system of standard norms. What autism has taught me is that there is no cookie cutter child. Our differences ought to be celebrated, not separated. So today, take a moment to say hi or smile at someone who might be a bit different. Acceptance starts with you. Welcome back. I'm Steve Adubato. We're now joined by Mr. Bob Garrett, who is the CEO of Hackensack Meridian Health. Good to see you, Bob. Good to see you. Thanks for having me, Steve. Um, Bob, lay this out for folks. Hackensack, the first case of COVID-19 in the state? Yeah, back in uh, on March 4th. It seems like um, years ago, seven weeks ago. And, uh, you know, after that first case came, of course, there was a huge ramp up of, uh, of cases. And, uh, you know, the the, the good news is we were we were prepared, but you know you never can totally prepare for something so unprecedented. You know, in my in my lifetime, I've never been through any of this. I'm, I'm, I think nobody really has. Uh, you know, and, and being on the front lines of 
healthcare, you know, my entire career, you know, we've we've had to respond to other emergencies, Hurricane Sandy, we uh, we had the Ebola uh, scare and the Ebola crisis, but um, nothing compared to COVID nineteen, just because of the the numbers and the speed of which things happened and changed was really unprecedented. Let me follow up on this. Um, I want to be clear so people understand Hackensack Meridian Health is a system, and I know, and let me disclose, I've done leadership development, particularly for physicians, and talk about how physicians and their leadership, their job has changed people on the front lines, and also HMH is one of the hospital systems supporting what we do. Bob, let me ask you, there are 14 hospitals within Hackensack Meridian Health, but you also have other health care related affiliates, correct? Yeah, so we have, uh, we actually are up to 17 hospitals now, Seven. part of Hackensack Meridian, uh, 14 uh, nursing homes that uh, long-term care facilities that we um, we own. And of course, that's been you know, a major uh, a major issue during this uh, pandemic. But we have a, we have a host of other um, um, health care providers. We have physicians' offices. We have urgent care centers, surgery centers, you know, really the full continuum of care. So we're we're located in 500 uh, different locations throughout the state of, uh, of New Jersey. And you know, e- even in terms of preparing for this pandemic, we, we had to prepare all of those sites. So it wasn't just the hospital, but it was really a system-wide preparation that went on. Well, let's talk about longer term, because if you want to check out, folks, if you want to check out what's happening day by day, Governor Murphy's press conferences, go to NJTV News, our colleagues at WNET as well with Metro Focus, check them out every day. We're looking at, dare I say, the longer term challenges. Uh, Bob Garrett, the long-term implications for hospitals, hospital systems, and the healthcare world, what do you see? So I see, you know, I certainly see healthcare uh, being delivered a lot, a lot differently. So from, if you're a patient coming into um, our health network or, or most health, work, health networks now, you're going you're gonna to face, you know, a different type of uh, a care delivery experience. So as an example, in order for us to really get ready for the return of a lot of non-COVID patients, because we've been taking care of so many COVID patients uh, over the last uh, seven weeks. Uh, we're doing, we, we've taken a lot of steps, Steve. We, uh, we have, as an example, every person that comes into our facilities gets their, uh, their temperature checked. Um, there are designated spaces for COVID and, and non-COVID. We've had to go through thorough cleaning processes. We're testing all patients coming in. We're testing many of our, uh, our team members as well. So it's a, it's a different experience. And, you know, one of the things that they're going to they're gonna, uh, find is, you know, the idea of waiting and waiting rooms, you know, for, for outpatients, I, I think are going to be a thing of the past because uh, there has to be social distancing. So you're, you're, you're going to be actually called on your cell phone to come in when your appointment is ready and you come right in from your car, you get your procedure, you get your test. And then if you're if you if you need to leave, you leave at, at that point. But you don't interact with uh, with many people. So the world of healthcare delivery is going to change. Another another um, element is telehealth. Right. And we saw during we saw during this pandemic uh, telehealth really blossom. You know, people were receiving um, healthcare through uh, through through telehealth. And um, we're actually you know in our medical group, which we have about 1,100 uh, providers in our medical group. We're actually almost uh, doing the volume of, uh, of patient um, visits as we did prior to the pandemic, but about half of them are being done through, uh, through telehealth now. I think that change will be uh, permanent. You know, another another change is uh, many of our team, we have 36,000 team members. Um, not all of them are on the front lines. Some of them work behind the scenes in um, information technology and finance and support functions. Uh, I think many of those that many of those people who have been working from home will continue to work from home. So I think that whole telecommuting trend is going to uh, continue. But there's no doubt that this crisis, this pandemic, has taken a big toll on hospitals, not just our infrastructure. You know, obviously, you know, we uh, we, we had to order uh, supplies and um, and personal protective equipment in in record numbers. We had to expand our capacity like we've never done before. We actually, Steve, we actually had to triple our um, intensive care. Capacity in, a, in a matter of uh, days and weeks. And one, one interesting story is up at Hackensack University Medical Center, literally within a couple of days, we were able to transform what was the cafeteria into a 72-bed COVID-19 uh, unit. And, uh, you know, kudos to our, our uh, construction and plant operations folks. They did a, just a great job in a short period of time. So, so there is really, you know, there really is a, um, a new norm here. And, and there's no doubt that that this has taken its toll on our infrastructure, but it's also taken a financial toll on the healthcare industry. And there's a lot, there's a big road ahead of us to, to have to recover. 
you know, uh, certainly, you know, from a financial perspective, uh, revenues are down and expenses are, are way up to be able to take care of patients during this pandemic. And we, we have to keep it that way because, you know, there's a lot of predictions that we're going to get that second wave. So we need to make sure mm-hmm. our healthcare system is as strong as possible from an infrastructure perspective and also from a financial perspective. The plasma transfusion therapy, what is it and why is it so significant? Because I know that the folks over at um, CDI, which stands for the Center, Center for Discovery, Discovery and Innovation, right? Right. Are they driving that with Dr. Perlin? Yeah, they really are, Steve. So this is really exciting. First of all, what a great story. So inspirational to see literally thousands of people who have recovered from COVID-19 donate their blood, their plasma, their antibodies to, uh, to be helping patients who are now suffering with uh, COVID-19. We've already done over 450 of these uh, uh, plasma infusions, and the early evidence is uh, is very very hopeful. Again, we still don't have you know enough data to to, to form any conclusions, but it really you know anecdotally, uh, if you talk to our clinicians on the front line, you talk to folks like Dr. Perlin who developed um, a serum that would uh, be able to be infused uh, with the plasma into patients who are sick. They're all very, very positive and optimistic about our early results. So keeping our fingers crossed, because as, as we all know, uh, there's no vaccine yet. And this is, this is one of the more hopeful therapies that have uh, come out over the last uh, six weeks or so. You've been listening to uh, Bob Garrett. I'm Steve Adubato remotely. He is uh, remote as well on Zoom. Uh, I want to thank Bob Garrett, who is the CEO of Hackensack Meridian Health, for joining us. Bob, stay well, stay safe, and particularly to the physicians, nurses, and all the frontline folks, they are the true heroes, as you've said, and many have said many times. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate you having me. You got it. We'll be right back right after this. To see more Think Tank with Steve Adubato programs and to listen to Think Tank with Steve Adubato, the podcast, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Welcome back, folks. We are honored to be joined by Tammy Murphy, who is the first lady in the great state of New Jersey and also the founding chair of the New Jersey Pandemic Relief Fund. First lady, it's good to uh, speak with you, even remotely. Thanks for having me, Steve. It's always good to see you. Last time we talked, it was Ab Drum Thwacket doing a half hour special on that extraordinary uh, place. By the way, go on our website. You'll see it right now and check out that Drum Thwacket special. Um, could you, for us, tell us exactly what the New Jersey Pandemic Relief Fund is? We'll put the website up, the dollars raised, what it's for, and the difference it's making. Sure. Um, so the New Jersey Pandemic Relief Fund um, is a, a nonprofit that we incorporated um, on March 24th. It uh, took about 10 days between uh, the idea coming up and our being able to get all the paperwork done and have our first, uh, our initial board uh, join. Um, we are uh, basically here to help. Um, the on the ground providers who we know are struggling um, in the wake of COVID-19 uh, to make sure that with the surge of new clients and guests they're trying to help, that they actually have the resources they need and are not gonna fold. Um, so we are basically here um, to help the most vulnerable across our state. Um, and, and we're kind of filling in gaps, you know, where we, we know that there are state, county and local resources. We know there are other foundations out there that are supporting certain organizations, but there are others that, you know, are, are really struggling. And so we are here to try and identify the needs and to um, help. Um, we, we start out with a hierarchy of needs that include basically um, stopping the spread of the virus, um, supporting um, the healthcare community, right. um, and providing the socioeconomic um, support and relief uh, required by our most vulnerable across the state. You know, the concert that I saw um, yes. that, that was all over everywhere, yeah. the name of that concert is, was? Jersey for Jersey. Raised a few bucks. It did. It did. We, we um, you know, most importantly, I, you know, that, that was an idea that I had and I thought, dare I, dare I, dare I? And <laughs> I reached out to um, John Bon Jovi and Bruce Springsteen and said, I have this idea. I want to give our state a virtual hug. And they said, oh, you want to do, you know, the national thing? And I said, well, not really. I kind of just want it to be, you know, exclusive to the New Jersey club and have all of New Jersey's finest, um, 
you know, talents entertain and and show showcase our um, essential workers. And just basically, I mean, everybody was tired of being stuck inside. And I thought, if we could all do the same thing for one hour, wouldn't it be great? And they both said yes. And then it was just- Where Danny it, DeVito and uh, uh, John Stewart come from? Um, I reached out to Danny DeVito <laughs> and John Stewart. Um, but, but I had help. Um, you know, uh, each of the people who got involved ended up helping me reach others. And it really became a, a groundswell of kind of oh, all yeah. of us coming together and just trying to do the best we could. I will tell you, by the way, we have so much talent in New Jersey that, that we could really have done a multi-hour event, um, but we, we stuck with the one hour because I think that's, that's what we needed. And I, it might have gotten old after, you know, an hour. Not at all, because I heard so many people who believe they're celebrities who said, hey, what about me? Well, that'll <laughs> happen down the road. Do listen, do listen, I mean, we, we really did. We, we really have so much talent here. And, and that was one of the things, you know, we, New Jersey um, sometimes gets knocked around a little bit. And we should be, you know, we should have real, real uh, pride in everything we do here. I mean, we've got an awesome state, awesome talent. And, and all those people who are on the front lines and doing all the right things for our state right now, just everybody coming together, couldn't have done it without all, everybody. Let me ask you, as we put this site up again, as I speak right now, as we're speaking right now, if someone wants to help, easy enough to go on the website, make a contribution, and those dollars will go directly to an organization, uh, a not-for-profit, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's making a difference, particularly around COVID-19. Yeah. Yep. It's true. We actually are really fortunate because uh, one of our uh, board members is underwriting all the administrative expenses for the fund. So that means every dollar that comes in goes right back out um, into our communities and in, in need. You know, there are so many difficult aspects of this for all of our families, for your family as well. And, and by the way, we wish uh, uh, Governor Murphy, who came back after serious surgery, significant surgery, I'm sure a lot sooner than he expected or wanted to, but he's been there every day and you and your family. But we're all trying to make a difference. Well, put it this way, all of us should be trying to make a difference. And we, we actually work with the, the Russell Berry Foundation on this, an initiative called Making a Difference, where we recognize, they recognize people are making a difference. To what degree do you believe that that's all of our responsibilities, not just the First Lady, the Governor, the, the Russell Berry Foundation, all of us need to be making a difference in the lives of others while we're trying to protect ourselves. Listen, it's absolutely incumbent upon each of us to do what we can to help out. And you know, what we can each individually do is different. Um, you know, 129 donors uh, for our fund gave a significant amount of money. They gave $10,000 or more. But we have over 55,000 donors. And that, that's someone who gave a dollar to, you know, uh, right on up. Yep. So, um, and the, the, the lion's share of the money we've raised is from, is, is on the backs of people contributing a little bit to the fund. But there's other ways, you know, people, um, you know, people are, are going to work each day, just showing up at work each day, just staying home and doing the right, right thing in the social distancing time to help flatten the curve. You know, everybody can do something. And uh, it's just a matter of figuring out ways that you can help and that are in your slipstream. Tammy Murphy is not just the first lady of uh, the Garden State, New Jersey, but she's also the founding chair of the New Jersey Pandemic Relief Fund. You've seen the website up throughout this program. Check it out. It's making a difference, a big difference in the lives of others. I want to thank you so much. You honor us by being with us. We look forward to seeing you again, hopefully at Drum Thwacket down the road. Um, I look forward to it. That would be great. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. Uh, all the best to you and your family. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. You too. I'm Steve Adubato. We thank you so much for joining us. Most importantly, um, stay safe, be well. See you next time. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, PSENG, Gibbons PC, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the Northward Center, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, Fedway Associates, Inc., Wells Fargo. And by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State. And by Employers Association of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ. And by ROINJ.
When I started working with children with autism over 25 years ago, my mission began. Autism is a multifaceted spectrum condition, which challenges our system of standard norms. What autism has taught me is that there is no cookie cutter child. Our differences ought to be celebrated, not separated. So today, take a moment to say hi or smile at someone who might be a bit different. Acceptance starts with you.